Hello everyone, this is Andy Nowicki, your right-wing English teacher, reporting again with a new video after a certain length of time. Those of you who are subscribed to this channel, uh, I suspect you already know about my other channel, Andy Nowicki, but if you don't, please uh, look into it. And uh, if you like what I talk about here, <clears throat> you might conceivably enjoy the videos that I post at my other channel, which is again under my name, Andy Nowicki. It strikes me that I should probably work on decor a bit uh, for these right-wing English teacher videos. <clears throat> Maybe I should give more of an impression of being an English teacher. I am not currently employed as an English teacher, although I, I did spend several years teaching English <clears throat> on uh, the community college level and on the high school level. So nothing, nothing big, nothing, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what would you, what would you call it? Uh, nothing prestigious. I have never had any prestigious, uh, teaching gigs, nothing Ivy league or otherwise. Uh, but that's fine with me. Uh, I was, I was uh, working the gigs I was given and I was fine with that. Uh, and uh, had a swell time while I was doing it, for the most part. I mean, I guess it was sort of a sort of off and on. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the aspect of it that was teaching, teaching English, and I enjoyed having students who were engaged. Of course, there were some students who weren't as engaged, and that's going to be the case. I suspect wherever you're at, even if you're one of those lucky buggers who has a prestigious job at Yale or Harvard or Brown or or wherever, uh, there's still going to be some students who just, just ain't feeling it. And that's the way it goes. <clears throat> of course, uh, the prefix to uh, English teacher, right wing English teacher, probably has, tells you a lot about why I was never employed at uh, a place like Harvard, Yale, or Brown. Not to say that I uh, academically could have qualified even if everything else was fair. But having the take the positions that I do, generally speaking, and being uh, a uh, duly cataloged member of the alt-right, according to such, uh, such trustworthy, eminently trustworthy organizations as the ADL and the SPLC, don't help my case. But in any case, I am uh, here again after uh, an absence of a certain length of time on this channel. And over the next few days, I want to zoom back a, a bit more with my discussion of Shakespeare. Now, what I've been honing in on the most, because it's the thing that really interests me and you, one could even say obsesses me to a great extent, is Hamlet. Hamlet is my favorite Shakespeare play. Hamlet is my favorite Shakespeare character. I mean, probably my favorite character, period. One of my favorite people, <laughs> even though he's only fictional. And I've spent a lot of time talking about Hamlet. I'm sure I'll, I will spend some time in the future talking about Hamlet, both the character and the play. But zooming back for a second, because Shakespeare did write a bunch of other stuff as well, besides Hamlet, let, let's talk for just a, a couple of minutes in the way of, of a sort of intro here an intro to something. I'm not sure how I'm going to follow up this intro right now. I'm kind of winging it, but uh, I just felt uh, felt a calling to comment on this particular uh, subject and give my thoughts. There are four plays that are usually spoken of in uh, uh, Shakespeare's canon as being the plays that he wrote when he was really at the height of his power as a writer. And those are Hamlet, Othello, Macbeth, and King Lear. Now, I just thought I would share a few of my general thoughts about these four, these big four. Um, and uh, what I have to say is, is entirely subjective 
It's my own impression, my, my own thoughts and feelings upon reading these plays and seeing, seeing them performed as well. Um, what strikes me about these plays in a general sense, what stays with me about these plays, uh, generally speaking, subjectively speaking? Um, let's start, of course, with the, the uh, elephant in the room, kind of. I mean, it's not, it's not an elephant in the room in that it's, it's certainly something I've talked about a lot. I mean, Hamlet is clearly, you would, as you, you know, anyone who, who watches the cha this channel would guess, obviously my favorite, the one that I gravitate to the most, the one that I feel called to, to called to uh, discuss the most because it is the one that I resonate with the most. And a lot has been said about Hamlet and whether he was understood or misunderstood, you know, Shakespeare's rendering of Hamlet and, and what became of uh, how Hamlet came to be portrayed uh, as this brooding figure, the, the melancholy Dane, and um, which, which had, I think, had something to do with Olivier's performance in, the, in the, the production of Hamlet that was put on, I think, in the late 40s. The, the movie version, of course, he, Olivier played him on stage as well. That that really seemed to go the farthest with this kind of, uh, you know, making him into uh, this uh, almost brooding, sulky, almost teenager. Even though he's he's a grown man, he's he's uh, you know in his thirties, his early thirties. But but he's just back from school, just back from Wittenberg, and uh, feels. Uh, feels depressed about how everything is looking and, and uh, you know, with his family, with everything that's been going down, with his father dying mysteriously and his mother remarrying his creepy uncle and all of that. And, you know, he's, he's the man in black uh, centuries before Johnny Cash, you know, and, and uh, he, he speaks of how uh, he, he dresses in this, in this manner because it gives voice to, to how he is, how he how he is deep down, he tells his mother. Uh, seems, Madame, nay, it is. I know not seems. Uh, speaking of his attire, uh, that his attire speaks for him. Um, so, anyway, this is all just to say that there are there is a school of thought out there that says there's much more to Hamlet, and I think they're right. There is much more to Hamlet than just that he's brooding and melancholy. Um, he is also uh, many other things, and among them, he's very funny. He's a funny guy. He's a very extremely witty person, and, and also a very charming person, but also a person with a lot of flaws, um, who uh, makes a lot of mistakes in spite of his brilliance. He's also just, I think the thing that stands out the most about Hamlet is his brilliance. But in any case, uh, the draw of Hamlet, I think, for me and for many others, is seeing how he responds to just this untenable situation. And I think it's something that's that's relatable. You know, whatever our own situations are, we have certain things, certain family circumstances, or whatever, that we have a, that uh, we kind of wonder, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to navigate this? What should we do in this case to get to the bottom of this? Do we really want to get to the bottom of this? Well, I guess we have to, but you know, we want to. But since, since we have to, how do we go about it? And, and so forth and so on. And, and seeing, confronting the evil that is there know, in, in the person of Claudius, but that no one seems to understand. He cloaks himself so well as something that's good, as a, you know, as a, as a good man. These are all, again, very interesting, compelling aspects to the play Hamlet. So, to discuss the other three of the big four, you've got uh, King Lear. I think King Lear might be, might be my second favorite. Um, of the four, of the big four. And the, and there's a, I should say for my part, even though I am, you know, an English teacher, not by trade anymore, but 
you know, I, I was getting paid to know stuff about literature for, for several years there. There, there is nevertheless a, a significant drop off in my knowledge uh, of these plays after Hamlet. I don't know the other three nearly as well. I haven't read them or poured over them or, or asked as many questions about them nearly as much as I have about Hamlet. But what strikes me about King Lear, and I refuse to, to shorten it to Lear, it's, it's so annoying. This is a little pet peeve of mine when people talk about, I was in a production of Lear last week. It was, it, uh, I, talk, I think I talk about this elsewhere. It's just, it's just an irritating kind of shorthand, like, I'm in the know. Um, you know, I'm an actor. I was in Lear. Anyway, all of that aside, um, what's most striking about King Lear are a couple of things. First of all, you've got a man who, is, as, as the play opens, is uh, completely absorbed in himself. I mean, maybe he's maybe he's a little senile. Uh, you know, uh, maybe he's uh, you know his his advanced age. Maybe that there's that offers some degree of. Uh, and we, maybe we can cut him a little bit of slack on that score. But he's somebody who begins the play by telling his three daughters, I'm going to go retire now. Uh, and you three are going to be in charge of the kingdom. And I've, I'm going to uh, divide the country into three places, in three different sections. And I'm going to give one of those sections to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give, uh, the most choice section of the, of those three to the one of you who can compliment me the best, to the one of you who can say the nicest things about me, really sweet talk me, really say, oh, daddy, daddy, you are so wonderful and so dear and blah, blah, blah. And two of his daughters who are bad girls, uh, Reagan and Goneril, they are, uh, more than willing to do this. In fact, they fall all over each other, trying to outdo one another in their praise of their father. But King Lear's one good daughter, Cordelia, sees the ruse, or sees what's really going on here. And in an instant, she uh, assesses the situation and realizes, I can't be a part, I can't be party to this. This is just in, this is just, uh, this is insufferable behavior on my father's part, and this entire situation is one in which uh, I just, I have no, it's so appalling, I don't want to have any part in. And so uh, Cordelia says to her father, uh, well, I love you as much as a daughter is duty bound to love a father, no more, no less, that's it. And it pisses uh, his her father off so much that uh, he banishes her. And that starts a whole chain of events in motion that end in great tragedy, uh, ultimately. But anyway, I, I, talk, I talked about three things that stood out to me with, with uh, King Lear. First of all, you've got King Lear uh, and his, you know, insane, insufferable uh, vanity, his desire to be stroked and his desire to be uh, kissed up to. And you've got his one daughter who was really looking out for him, really, or, or really wanting the best, you know, will, true, uh, interested in willing the good. Uh, and she sees that this is not her father at his best. And she decides to take a stand that could be perceived as unloving in some ways and could be perceived as harsh in some ways but nevertheless it's what she chooses to do uh, in this situation and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's taking it, it's taking uh, a uh, measure uh, that is extreme because again she basically says I'm not going to be mushy at all I'm not even going to be, I'm not going to sugarcoat what I'm saying at all. I'm just going to be completely blunt and say, uh, I don't love you, Father, any more than I'm supposed to love you. 
you know, it's my duty as a daughter to uh, love his love her father and to care for for him to honor him. But beyond that, that's there's nothing more. I'm not going to talk about oh you're so wonderful in this way and that way and the other way. So ultimately, this all leads to tragedy, and that's the third thing I think is that stands out about about uh, King Lear is the ending is so tragic and it is so bleak and uh, I don't want to say it's completely hopeless because they're, they're it's not like it's not like uh, the good guys win the good guys don't win I mean when the good guys uh, the bad guys don't prevail nevertheless without giving anything away right now uh, it it, uh, it ends in a way that just breaks your heart and makes you feel devastated. There's no play that's more devastating, has more devastating of an ending, I don't think, that I'm aware of, than Shakespeare's King Lear. So this is becoming a, a, a lengthier discussion. Maybe I'll, I, I've, I've decided now I'm going to break this into two separate videos. So uh, again, I'm just talking subjectively about things that stand out about Shakespeare's big four and uh, uh, next time in the next video, which I'll record maybe tomorrow, uh, I'll hone in a little bit more on the other two of the big four. Um, and those, that would be Macbeth and Othello. So thanks for watching. My name's Andy Nowicki, uh, your right-wing English teacher, signing off.